Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is... Amazing! Thousands of copies have been sold across the United States and the world. You can pick up your copy today on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It is your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is your special guest host, Dr. Michelle Cantu-Wilson. I'm the owner of Vida Linda Consulting. Vida Linda means beautiful life in Spanish, and my team and I are working to make higher education a more fulfilling and beautiful space by doing leadership training for higher education institutions and going from the executive leader all the way down to the student leader. I'm also an elected official in higher education. I serve as a trustee for San Jacinto College in Southeast Texas. I'm excited to announce that we have a special guest co-host, Stephen Coslin. Stephen, welcome. Would love to have you introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm an academic by training. I spent um, a little over three decades on the Harvard faculty where I've been chair of psychology and then dean of social sciences. After that, I went to Stanford, where I've been a graduate student and ran the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. Following that, I ended up being the first academic uh, and uh, founding dean, chief academic officer at Minerva, where I stayed for about five and a half years. And then I founded something called Foundry College, which is for working adults to help them acquire skills and knowledge that will not easily be automated. And that's, that's still going strong. And now I've started something new called Active Learning Sciences, which is sort of going wholesale, as it were. Uh, we build educational programs, mostly using active learning. I've just finished writing another book called um, Active Learning with AI, where I've actually shown how to leverage five principles from the empirical literature on learning and memory uh, using AI. So you can actually have it developed all sorts of interesting exercises that can be done in real time and really draw out what you're trying to teach. That is amazing. Stephen, we can't go a single day without seeing AI headlines, right? Mm -hmm. I know there were just two in recent days. We have AI, um, an agreement among AI companies uh, of some sort that just came out today. And then yesterday it was AI and um, the news, writing the news, right? I'm sure I saw that headline somewhere. So uh, I would love to go back and listen to your interview to see the kind of work that you're doing. But today is not about us. Today is about our special uh, uh, guest. And our special guest is well known uh, in the industry. Um, actually, it's in intersecting industries. Uh, Matt Siegelman is the president of the Burning Glass Institute. And I told uh, the gentleman before we got started, folks, that I, I, I have not uh, read bios before when I've been um, a host or guest co-host, but I'm going to read this one because something funny and fascinating that I found about Burning Glass, their social media, and their website is the phenomenal writing. So I'm going to take you for a little ride before we turn over the mic to our special guest. Um, and so I might not read every single thing, but I'm going to read some of the more fascinating uh, writing that I've seen. Um, so you know his name is Matt Siegelman. You know he's the president of the Burning Glass Institute. He's dedicated his career to unlocking new avenues for mobility, opportunity, and equity through skills. So he and his team created the field of real-time labor market data. And I love the idea that they created this field. That is fascinating to me. Um, Matt previously led MC Burning Glass to become a leading authority on the global market for talent, harnessing advanced AI, which is why Stephen is here as our guest co-host, and natural language processing to render data that provide unprecedented granularity on the changing landscape of opportunity for workers. Okay, one of my favorite sentences. By tracking demand for tens of thousands of skills across over 30 countries, Matt's work has cracked the genetic code of an increasingly dynamic market with deep insights that not only chart how work is being redefined, but also identify the skills that bridge the gap between people and opportunity. Matt has previously been with um, McKinsey and Company and Capital One. Um, he continues to sh serve as the chairman for Burning Glass MC. Uh, I think that's correct. And he's the founder of Mainline Classical Academy, 
which brings classical liberal arts curriculum and a rigorous study in math and science to kindergarten level on up. Uh, he's also dedicated to the idea that children are never too young to learn great things. Matt, it is such an honor to meet you and to interview you today. We are going to kick it off by asking you, what do you do and how do you do it? Um, well, I can answer the how do I do it, um, which is not sleep. Um. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously, that bio was a lot, a lot of good work, though. Um, so, you know, my uh, so much of my career at this point um, has been spent um, really focused on the landscape of opportunity for for workers and learners. Um, uh, 20 years ago, I set out to uh, um, to to build the company that's now called Lightcast that, that was Burning Glass and MZ Burning Glass and now Lightcast. Um, and our core breakthrough innovation was the idea, first off, that if you want to uh, understand the landscape of work, you need to understand or the world of work, you need to understand it as as um, a pattern problem rather than a rules problem. And that sounds mm -hmm. kind of wonky, but let me explain what I mean by that. Um, the idea that that I think you know used to predominate in the market was that if you want to understand who gets the job, who's the right person to put at the top of the stack, um, how do we um, how do we find talent and match more effectively? It's it's you know uh, you you have a set of criteria, mm -hmm. and you look for people who meet those criteria, and so it's a uh, a view of of talent which is about which is almost um, by definition about excluding rather than about including. Mm. Um, and um, so one of the first innovations we brought to bear was the idea that you can actually think of this as um, as uh, as patterns. How do how do real people move through their careers? Um, mm -hmm. What are the skills that they have and how, what does that suggest about what they could do as opposed to what they are doing? And so therefore, how do you build a uh, an awareness of the market and, uh, and a, an ability to affect matches based on including as opposed to excluding? Hmm. The second core breakthrough that um, that that you know became key to so much of my work uh, and perhaps even more defining of it was the idea that we can't have a job market that works for everyone if okay. we don't have um the kind of information that people need in order to navigate their careers if we don't have the information that's needed for employers to find talent and the kind of information that um really um through most of uh of history sort of defined our understanding of labor markets has been um you know kind of broad macroeconomic data the kind of things that that um public agencies collect and the like and and those are by the way very helpful so this is not about saying hey look you know there's uh those kinds of things are outdated um but they're designed to track an economy as opposed mm. to affect changes in people's careers Mm, good point. Um, so, you know, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, for example, tracks a, a job called um, demand for a job called a computer programmer. Uh, I, I ran a software company for 20 years. I, I don't know what a computer programmer is. Um, I know what Ruby on Rails developers are. I know what, um, you know, uh, Java uh, developers are and Python right. engineers and so forth. Right. But uh, if you're if you're just trying to kind of see like, okay, how much is the economy moving up and down in those big categories and making sure they're pretty consistent is probably mm -hmm. the right way to do it. But if you're on the ground trying to manage your career, if you're a counselor trying to support people, if you're a policymaker trying to figure out how do, what are the, the big, what are the talent needs that we're going to have? How do we build a skill base that we need to be competitive? Those kinds of things, um, you need a much more granular level of insight. And so what we did was we went out and we, we said, you know what, we don't need to rely on the kind of surveys that uh, the statistical agencies usually use. Most hiring is happening online. So let's go and, and actually go to where the jobs are. Let's go to where people are posting their, their career histories. And let's then be able to create a language to translate them into so that we can actually uh, understand when one job says, uh, you know, hey, the job title is an associate and another one says, 
um, a guest services representative or whatever. We mm. understand the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and likewise, for the tens of thousands of skills that are out there. And that's been um, really, really important in, um, in giving the kind of insights that can, uh, can allow us to be more effective in managing careers and finding talent in building prosperity and ultimately a growing mobility. Um, you, you know, it's funny, you, 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 um, you focused on that sentence in my bio about um, yeah. uh, cracking the genetic code. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so if you're asking me the, the sort of uh, what I do and, and, and the how, here's why I think the, the genetic code is actually such an important metaphor. Um, you know, in the past, as we've understood the world of, of jobs, it's, you know, not surprising that we, we try to track that world through jobs, right? That's kind of like the no duh, mm -hmm. uh, right? You know, you want to understand the job market, we'll understand jobs, but you can't actually understand jobs unless you understand what they're about. Mm -hmm. Jobs I essentially agree. are about the skills and capabilities that um, they're asking people to exercise. And that's the layer at which the market um, has the greatest dynamism. It's the layer at which um, we can see how talent and opportunity connect. Mm -hmm. um, it's the layer at which we can actually build, build effective bridges between jobs where people are being displaced and jobs where um, that are going to define the future. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, that is fascinating. But what you, when you're talking and you're explaining all of this, what I'm thinking is, one, I'm a I'm a teacher, so I can see the interest that you have and the passion you have for the subject, uh, and I, I I get how deeply ingrained you are in this entire industry. Where does this come from? Why is this so interesting to you? Why is this your passion? You know, I think so much of it become comes from um, the fact that uh, we can see uh, so much opportunity, so much potential in mm -hmm. um, in people. Um, I can, you know, I, I look around and I see people for um, for who they can be and I see our country for what it can be. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, at the same time, I, I think is accompanied not only with um, an optimism, but also with uh, um, a sense of sadness mm -hmm. because so often um, there's uh, people wind up stuck nonetheless. Um, right. You know, it's, it's uh, so I, in a lot of senses, you know, I think the, the greatest, um, tragedy in our economy today is also one of its greatest opportunities. It's kind of like your side view mirror says, like, you know, uh, objects mirror closer than they appear. And people um, and opportunity are often just a few skills apart. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, hey, if we can um, unlock those, those gaps, mm -hmm. then um, we have so much potential to um, for for people to to achieve the kind of mobility that that defines the American dream, we have so much potential for the country to um, be uh, to just achieve so much prosperity. I mean, I, Stephen, you were telling about what you're doing um, with you know with founding college and the work that you're doing to help workers acquire the kinds of skills that make them robot proof. And I've got to imagine that same idea is animating that work. Yeah, I actually co-authored a paper with Joseph Aoun on that topic, as yeah. a matter of fact. Um, yeah, uh, that segues into some questions I got for you. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, first, you made a, a distinction, which I thought was pretty interesting, between skills and capabilities. Can you mm -hmm. say a bit more about that distinction? And Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think, um, and there's a lot of different um, languages that people use around this, and competencies and capabilities and 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 the like. But but either way, um, I see um, a significant difference between those kind of broad um, capabilities um, and their expression 
their, uh, their application or expression in skills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's these days everyone's talking about skills and it's important to uh, and I'm and I think that in itself is actually a great move forward because we're we're really starting to think about what are what does it take to do a job? What are the you know, how does somebody acquire that know how and how do we hire in ways that are based upon what somebody can do as opposed to what credential they bring with them. So that's all really positive. But I do think it's important that we map backwards to say, OK, um, if somebody knows Python, right, Python is a tool. What is um, what are what are they using Python to do? It's sort of like asking the so what. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think you get to this broader understanding of human capability. Um, mm -hmm. It's also really important because skills are highly dynamic, capabilities a lot less so. Mm. Um, right? You know, um, mm. what what language somebody's coding in today is likely to be a different one from the one they're using in two to three years from now. On the other hand, mm. um, the core um, foundations of computational thinking, of problem solving, um, of mathematical reasoning that are expressed through those skills mm -hmm. um, are, are enduring. Mm. So that, that's fantastic. At Foundry, um, we were inspired in part by a report I got from uh, two people I knew who were on a nonprofit foundation here in New York. They were working with high school dropouts to teach them fixed cell phones. You know what happened after three years? What happens to cell phones after three years? Oh, gosh, the, those models were obsolete. Correct. And they were out of a job. And the oh reason for that is that they taught them very narrowly and brittly. They yeah. taught them vocationally. You know, mm -hmm. if this is broken, do that. If other things are not working, do this other thing. Mm -hmm. And what they needed was something very much like what I think I just heard instead of focusing on narrow skills that are applicable right now in this context, take a step back and think about the broader capabilities that you're gonna to need to adapt to a changing world. It, it, I think that's exactly the right orientation and it's extremely hard to get people to appreciate how mm -hmm. important that is. Do you have any thoughts about how to do that? I mean, I would say first off, just uh, I would think of it um, as a both and um, rather than an either or. Um, sure. you know, the reality is, is those, those high school, um, uh, graduates or dropouts, you know, who were being trained to fix cell phones, it's not that they didn't need to learn the core capabilities of how to fix the technology of the, of the moment, but they also needed, mm -hmm. um, the skills to be able to continue learning the skills to acquire mm -hmm. new skills. Mm -hmm. Um, it's exactly, by the way, the, the issue that confronts the liberal arts today. I mean, I think there's, yes, been a, that's what I was I, thinking. Yeah, yeah nice. like a huge crisis, right, with uh, with um, so many students defecting from the liberal arts, um, moving to applied subjects. Um, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, sort of the common narrative is they're moving out of liberal arts and going into STEM. And actually, that's that's not actually true. STEM uh, STEM majors take a sort of a level of um, of of. Um, um, of dedication that that um, a lot of students aren't necessarily willing to invest in. Mm -hmm. you, but you do see a lot of students moving out of liberal arts into applied subjects, um, not necessarily to their advantage. And I can you know more on that in a second. But mm -hmm. um, but you know here's the thing, it's um, and this is the paradox of it. When you look at what employers are seeking, when you, you know, I've, I've spent most of my career analyzing literally billions of job postings and um, what employers um, ask for um, more than anything else are the, are the core foundational skills. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, the more data driven a job is, the more tech enabled a job is, mm -hmm. the more emphasis employers put, the more relative emphasis they mm -hmm. put on those core foundational skills. Right. So right. those jobs that are kind of defining the future um, are literally have three times the demand um, as, of other, as other jobs for collaboration skills, double the demand for writing skills, 50% greater demand for research and mm -hmm. problem solving skills, the list goes on from there. Right. Um, and those are the bedrocks of the American liberal arts heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be easy just to say, OK, well, great. You know, liberal arts are, you know, we're, we're in a great place. We're teaching the right sets of things. 
Um, now uh, all we need is just convince people of it. But um, that's not quite right either, mm -hmm. because yeah. the reality is is that employers um, more than more than ever are looking for uh, graduates to come to them uh, ready made ready. exactly mm -hmm. with all that's the not skills going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, it's. Um, and and at some level, it says that hey, that's totally unreasonable that students should be expected to have these these really very specific. Like you know, you'll see employers asking for recent graduates to have enterprise research planning software skills. I mean, they, right? Who learns that in college? But it sounds unreasonable. But mm -hmm. if they know, hey, look, the students probably going to leave in twelve or eighteen months. They can't get a return on investment. Train you up. Mm -hmm. So what that says is that we've got a great heritage. We've got to build on it rather than 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 escape trying to escape it. We, mm. the, the right solution here is not go full on vocational. So in terms of the how, um, I think this is about conceiving of education training programs as more uh, um, kind of like a well, we'll go I'll keep going with the the genetic metaphors here, sort of like a of, of a double helix, right? You know, of where we're binding together the core foundations with the practical applied skills. You know, the right. way that a lot of education structures work today is you do what they call gen eds up front. Um, mm -hmm. And then after you've gotten all that under your belt, maybe at the end, you know, you'll get to the applied skills. Um, That's learning without context. And that is so hard if yes. we want to build skilled workers. Learning without yes. context, it doesn't make any sense. It's a context problem. And the other thing is this, it ignores the fact that um, particularly in, in higher education, um, most learners today are working learners. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what it's doing is it's, um, it's loading too much onto deferred gratification. It's saying, hey, go, go, you know, like learn for a whole bunch of years. And then we promise, right? Like we promise it'll be worth it, except we don't even promise. Sorry, Stephen. So that, that is exactly right. So we humans are prone to something called hyperbolic discounting. It's a mm. behavioral economics mm. thing where the further off something is in the future, the more we discount those consequences. So when you think about the difference, I'm still back on skills versus capabilities. The skills have immediate obvious utility. The capabilities are a frame around them that equips you to adapt as things go on. You're right, it's both, you have to do both. People are not motivated for something that's gonna pay off later in the future. Mm. This is the, the it's true. So how do you do it's it? It's true. So how do you I, motivate people so they see that it's in their interest to do this investment? That's what it is, an investment in building these broader capabilities. Oh, yeah. Join the movement to mobilize and revolutionize higher education by picking up your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education today. This book has been featured in Forbes, NPR, Harvard Business Review, CEO World Magazine, NBC News, CBS News, and Business Insider, among many others. Don't miss out on what today's highest college leaders have to say about the future of higher education. Pick up your copy on Amazon. I think it's it's um, it may introduce a new model for how to affect stackability. I know, you know, for, for the, for the ed nerd in, in the audience, right. You mm -hmm. know, um, we've all been talking about stackable education models. That's this idea that, that you can, instead of having to do it all in one big go, right. you can, you can break it up into to parts. And, you know, the reality is there have been very few institutions um, uh, that have been able to engineer it. And I think the exception proves uh, the point. Um, that community it, it really colleges have been. community colleges have to some degree, um, particularly in their workforce programs. Um, right. But the majority of their enrollments are, are of course, in uh, uh, in in degree transfer programs for most most community mm -hmm. colleges. Um, community colleges have been very effective in in their workforce training. But I think you know what this says is this, right? You know, most um, attempts at stackability, I think, have failed. Because what we try to do is stack the learning in units that accord to academic structures, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to how we can think about um, like uh, wine flights or something like that, right? Like in a restaurant, like, okay, you know, you're, sure. 
make it something where you, we recognize that our learners are working. Right. right, you're going to work and you're learning, and and then you make a jump, and then you're going to be able to work some more and learn some more. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can re-engineer um, the uh, the learning in ways that are designed to enable people to keep making steps, mm -hmm. uh, that um, could be a really powerful transformation. Think of it this way. You know, there's a bunch of um, of boot camps and so forth out there right now, which are doing heroes work um, of taking very small groups, um, typically highly selected, you know, and and getting them to go from being you know the proverbial coal miner to a code to a coder or something like that, um, and and that's terrific and we should celebrate it, but um, most people aren't capable of um, leaping tall buildings in a single bound. I know I'm right. Uh, and so um, what most people need to do is, is, is take steps. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a few years ago, I remember we looked at, um, at uh, what happens to retail workers, um, you know, five, 10 years on, and five, I think five years on. And there was a, it wasn't a huge number, but, but a non-trivial number, nonetheless, of um, retail workers who wound up in IT. And I remember scratching my head and thinking, okay, this is either, um, you know, something we did wrong in the data, or these are probably the folks who were working their way through college and, you know, in a retail environment and, and they wound up in IT. Actually, what more often we were seeing was something that looks like this. I'm selling cell phones at Best Buy um, or consumer electronics. Right. I get a little bit of training and I move over to setting up people's consumer electronics and what they call the geek squad. I get a little mm -hmm. more training. And I get a plus certification and, and stackable I get onto training. it. Mm -hmm. Stackable careers mm -hmm. and then working backwards from there to stackable training. Mm -hmm. But notice exactly. that every one of those stages was useful in its own right. Yes, so exactly. Not, sure. Yeah. You didn't yeah. have to invest in something that's only going to pay off later. Well, in a long term, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but at each step, the increment immediately its value was on its sleeve. It could be paying it paid off immediately. It wasn't something like someone told you, you know, eat your spinach is good for you. Ten years from now, you won't have cavities or something. <laughs> but um, well, I, yeah. What you made me think of, Matt, was this, and and you're onto it, and I and community colleges are onto it, and people from poverty have been onto it for years. I know I have. Uh, and first generation students are onto it. And it's the idea that there, there, is, there is a cultural shift in the nation that is right in front of us. And, and you're definitely plugged into it where job training and university training and job attainment is being seen for something entirely different than what the expectations used to be. It used to be that you're gonna send your kids to college and they're just gonna get a good job, period. Punto y final, you're done. You got a good job, it's done, right? It's guaranteed. That world does not exist anymore. It never existed from an equity perspective for all populations, right? Um, job training. There is no guarantee that you get that job training and that you're gonna get promoted because a lot of factors go into that, right? So then there's that nuance there. And then, you know, just the idea of responsibility, because when what you're talking about, when you say we, right, and, and these organizations and all stakeholders, there is this expectation that who we're receiving at the multiple levels in the different organizations and industries um, are going to be prepared. So as a community college professor and leader, we're always, you know, well, these students are coming out of high school and they don't have critical thinking. They don't know how to problem solve, right? They don't have emotional intelligence or social intelligence. So we see the gap, right? But are we addressing it? Then you have your community college students who go to transfer to university. And obviously there's gonna be a gap there, right? A gap in knowledge, a gap in applicability, uh, a gap in being able to, you know, scaffold information. And then you have that university graduate and even the community college graduate, right? Who has that credential, but they learned a lot of this without context into a particular industry because they still don't know what they want to do. And then you have those uh, employers who are then 
scratching their heads and banging their heads against the wall because they have to do the training. They have to create these situations where you have the stackable, you know, uh, micro credentials in an industry. Um, but it, there is, this is a large systemic national issue that I think you are working to address in the face of what Stephen does and, you know, what his industry is, which is AI and the, the threat of worker replacement. So that urgency that you feel, how do you communicate that to actual organizations? How do you actually help organizations? What is, what is the jumping off point? What do you do for them? Any organization. So, so two years ago, I, um, I uh, stepped out of, of uh, what's now Lightcast um, after 20 years. Um, and I, I stepped out in order to launch a fully independent nonprofit, which is called the Burning Glass Institute. Um, and the Burning Glass Institute is designed to build on the kinds of these, these incredibly powerful data that now exist um, that um, folks like Lightcast are, are doing fantastic work to provide. But to, to, to think about how do we leverage them? Um, how do we um, leverage them to drive transformations in communities? How do we leverage them? to drive transformations in, in people's lives and in the mobility that they can experience. Um, so a lot of what I think the big opportunities are here is to, um, it, you know, for example, with, with community colleges, um, uh, you meant, you know, I think are, are play a, a tremendously important role. Um, and I think have the need, and we have the need for them to play an even bigger role Mm -hmm. um, in bridging gaps. Um, imagine if um, instead of trying to solve the social problem of people's displacement, mm -hmm. um, we could start, and this is actually, we're working on a project um, uh, like this right now at the Institute, where we can start by saying, okay, inside this community, what are the jobs that matter, so to speak? Now, every job matters, every job brings dignity, but there's some jobs that are at sort of a four-way intersection right. between, um, uh, you know, kind of offering real opportunity for mobility for workers, um, addressing pain points for employers, um, being critical to, to growth for, uh, for key sectors and representing avenues for broadening uh, equity in the workforce. And we can start off saying, okay, what are those places where um, we see, um, where what are those kinds of jobs? We see that kind of opportunity. Um, and then let's work to say, who's, who's not coming along? If that's where the growth is happening, Okay, so um, if it's like uh, it the, the logistics and supply chain, so you're saying like, if you could like give me more like specific, so get, pick an industry and and put it put the yeah, context per perfect. There. You know, uh, um, I was just uh, I know you're at San Jack. I was just uh, talking with Minita Ramirez, excuse me, at Laredo College. Oh, um, they're wonderful over and, there. And she was talking about just how much of a logistics um, hub Laredo is becoming mm -hmm. um, as, uh, as Mexico has now supplanted China as America's greatest trading partner. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so let's say you're, you're in Laredo, and I think these are specific to communities, right? I think yes. you know, we can define a set that are national, but I think we have to realize that just like uh, Tip O'Neill famously said, all politics are local, right? All, all, all right. jobs are local. Yeah. Um, right. So you're in Laredo and logistics. And let's say there's there's um, the people who are driving uh, the the, um, you know, logistics coordinators, logistics analysts, mm -hmm. um, you know, traffic planners, whatever are key to um, Laredo's economic growth. Mm -hmm. Then the key to that is to say, OK, look. Um, let's assume for the moment that the workforce we have is the one we've got to work with. Okay. We are sadly, um, I think, uh, um, very far from uh, seeing bipartisan cooperation on immigration reform. I agree. Um, American workforce is shrinking for the first time in history. So um, when you put those two things together, if there are sets of jobs that are critical to someplace, 
we've got to be able to find that talent from within. Mm -hmm. So instead of expecting that we're going to pull people in, how do we pull people up? Mm -hmm. Um, And so then the question is, okay, so we've got these logistics coordinator jobs that are really important. What are talent pools in Laredo or more broadly in Texas who have maybe 60% of the skills that we need? Excellent. This is where, again, that Excellent. sort of like genetics works, right? Because then we're not trying to say, how do we train somebody all the way up from scratch into that role? Very so good. Here's, yes. And it also becomes key to building equity in the workforce because mm-hmm. a lot, oftentimes those talent pools that are uh, have many of the right sets of skills are more diverse, more available. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so can be critical to addressing um, talent shortages to be able to find sources of talent for, uh, for, for needs that are going to become increasingly important. Well, Could- what you do, Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I just want to acknowledge what you're doing too right now, Matt, by giving us that really oh. specific example is you're teaching employers how to think about or from an asset-based mindset what skills do your workers already have or what skills do nearby communities already already have that you can capitalize on and i think from a leadership perspective that's a wonderful lesson stephen and and, and uh, just one one thing stephen i mean one thing is just on your point about mindset it's also about what skills exist already inside your company mm-hmm. um most companies don't have um the mindset to look at their workers for what roles they could be doing as opposed to what roles they are doing. Um, Very good. This fits with your whole pattern approach, obviously. Yeah. 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 It's really hard to look at somebody who's a treasury analyst and say, hey, she could be a cyber uh, cyber analyst which by the way, are two talent pools that are actually surprisingly closely related. You wouldn't think, mm-hmm. right? but they're, they're both doing a fair amount of um, incident uh, investigation. They're both doing a lot of process uh, analysis. Um, you know, there's certainly a set of skills that a treasury analyst doesn't have that she'd need to become a cyber analyst, but, but that's um, knowable and bridgeable. Um, mm-hmm. But to do it, you first have to say, wait a second, this person could be you know, she could be doing more than she is doing today. And, and that's, that's hard. All right, well, Stephen. I would, I would love to go down a rabbit hole here, but I don't think it's appropriate <laughs> um, about uh, vector databases and how to set them up so that you can do the similar, your pattern approach. So you can do it not just against uh, jobs that are available, but what you need to learn in order to flesh out the vector to be able to be closer in the space. But let's, let's not go there. What I was really struck by Anytime you want, though, I would love that. Ah, I'm happy, happy. I was going to say, I want to go down a rabbit hole, but it had nothing to do with vectors, Stephen. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, okay, well, we'll do another rabbit hole. Um, I was really struck by a comment you made a minute ago, which you said, all jobs are local. Yes. And here I am sitting in New York City, and I'm working with somebody in Paris, somebody uh, in, in Japan. I've got a job, big job right now in Seoul, South Korea. Um, I can live any place I want, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Uh, this whole shift towards remote work looks to me like something isn't going to reverse. And you've been mentioning mobility, but mostly in a social context, but there's also geographic mobility. That is, we can live wherever we not want to the extent we're doing remote work. So I wondered how that whole trend, which is pandemic, post-pandemic, for the accelerated, it was already happening, accelerated, affects this idea that all jobs are local. So uh, first of all, I think it's it's important to distinguish between the kinds of jobs that the three of us have, exactly, and the kinds of jobs that most Americans, um, most people around the world have. Right. Um, you know, if you're a phlebotomist, you can't, um, you know, you you can't work virtually. Um, you can't no, you do cannot. your job remotely. Right. Um, and um, and so. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, I think for the most, for most jobs will continue to have um, a significant local component to them. Do we have data on that, by the way? I mean, I'm, I've never seen it. Is, is there a breakdown? Uh, it's something? interesting, actually. I haven't seen a, a direct breakdown of it. It would be easy enough to, to figure out, um, but. Right. I look at community I, colleges because if you think about it during, sorry to interrupt you, Matt, but no, just please. a real quick example. 
uh, community colleges that have vocational programs, technical programs like nursing programs, welding programs, automotive programs, those didn't shut down during the pandemic because there's no way to teach the students those skills without them being in person. And so you could look at it from a community college workforce development angle research wise mm -hmm. and find out what those programs are and then, you know, match to the industries. But um, I what wanted to shift What percentage? Just what oh, roughly? Yeah. What percentage of, of the more practical jobs oriented programs that are offered in community colleges can't be done remotely? I think what, uh, so I, I can get back to you with, with the percentage. I think I would, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, other would, piece, the other piece is when you find one that can't be done remotely, can you parse it? Can you break off the parts that require being in person from the parts that don't? So, and can it be done in a way that they can commute in for a week, a month or something to do those parts? Mm, that would be a challenge on the employer for sure. That, but it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a great question. I want to pivot a tiny bit because we're running out of time and we still have two questions that we have to ask because that is the ed up way. Um, Matt, you were talking about um, all of the employer uh, matching, if you will, um, that has to be done when it comes to looking at uh, potential employees and current employees and then the skills that they need to have. I notice uh, as someone who does resume and interview and networking uh, skills training that we're kind of stuck in a cycle of uh, an employer posting a job application that has the required skills, the preferred skills and the required education, and then potential employees looking at those skills and matching to those skills um, and just saying, yes, I have this and you're asking for this. And so the resume reflects the job description, right? And so here we are in this little cycle. But then I'm noticing that there are actual institutions and organizations that are doing employee surveys where they're looking at job descriptions and they are uh, actually finding out what people do at their jobs. <laughs> like, we mm -hmm. should know that, but I think we have kind of gotten into a rhythm of assuming everyone is doing what they were hired to do, not really acknowledging that we've gone through a seismic shift because of the pandemic and that work has changed, right? Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, that aspect of knowing what your employees are doing and the value of diving into that with a survey or some concerted effort. It's a critically important step. And I think we finally have both the um, the data substrate and the analytical bent that are, need, that are needed to actually um, live up to it. Your words uh, are killing me, Matt. Forward. You're the one doing uh, all the writing. These words, did you say analytical bent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I just um, love the word. Uh, you know, look, I, I mentioned before that I sort of spent uh, spent 20 years um, looking at, at billions of job uh, postings mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we used to joke that that it's, you know, you, you kind of come to feel like an, uh, an archaeologist after a while. Um, there, there are all these kind of layers of sediment that you have to kind of uh, break away. Um, right. You know, people just add in requirements over time and they tend to stick, um, you know, where, um, uh, you know, somebody at some point said, oh, well, we should ask for a college degree and, you know, and, and then... Uh, it just stays there, right? Um, and I think right. what we're we're finally starting to do is to look at okay, not only what are people doing, but what are the most effective and successful people in the world doing? Very good. Um, and what characteristics do they have? What skills do they bring with them? Therefore, what's important and what's not? Mm -hmm. In a lot of roles, we're finding that. Um, college degrees um, are not effective predictors of success in a role. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I think, you know, we've seen employers certainly um, in, in a talent short market increasingly embracing that. We've seen over uh, the past five years, but a 14% decline in the prevalence of employers asking for college degrees, mm -hmm. which is um, a very significant change. Um, where um, we're also seeing correspondingly when they take out the degrees, they tend to be uh, more articulate about the skills that um, you need. Now, it's, that doesn't mean that, interesting. Um, that degrees don't matter. Um, degrees very often do matter. And, and a college degree has been 
um, for many people, um, a singular uh, um, uh, a source of, of value in their careers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important for an employer to know when it matters. Um, you know, it's funny, we looked at in some recent research that we did looking at the, the uh, adoption of skills-based hiring, we looked at a bunch of tech companies um, because they've often been so public in saying, hey, we don't care if you, if you, uh, if you have a degree, we just care if you can code. Um, and it turns out not really true, um, first right. of all, um, right? So actually, when you look at what they're, you know, how they hire, they're still hiring for degrees in many cases. Um, one exception um, uh, was was IBM, which really, um, really did a, um, took some aggressive action to um, cut job to, uh, college degree requirements rather for most of their job descriptions. But to me, what was most impressive about it was not just they sort of stopped asking. Um, but they went from, let's say, about 70% of their jobs asking to about 20%. And then they went back up to about 30 or 35%. Mm, they, so they, they that, pivoted upon learning. That, that's right. Yeah, so like to me, I actually thought that they, the fact that they increased um, a little bit mm -hmm. to me was, was great because it said they were doing the analysis that you just described. Mm -hmm. Somebody went back and said, okay, we took them out, but actually in some places, maybe we shouldn't have. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's exactly what we need to do. And it's exactly what we need to to communicate, because one of the big problems that we have when you're describing before all the disjoints that happen in the market between high school and community college and between community college and college and between college and, and starting an employer. So much of what we have is a signal processing problem where we're not yes. sending the signals and we're not effective at hearing the signals. Right. If um, an employer started working with community colleges the way we work with any other supplier, mm -hmm. you would develop really good specs. You would mm -hmm. communicate those specs. You would evaluate your vendors. You would, you know, um, you would, you would, um, uh, you would uh, preference the vendors who are doing well for you. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what happens um, today. We're, now we're, we're kind of mealy mouthed about what we need, um, generally unreflective, uh, uh, and right there. Uh, and and then mm -hmm. um, you know we don't actually build effective um, partnerships between mm -hmm. employers and, and education institutions. And I think that's where we're going to kind of end it before we go to the last couple of questions. What you where you took us. Um, Matt, is you put the responsibility on the employer to have the skills that they so want their employees and that institute or colleges want their students to have. If we are not being, you said, reflective, if we are not thinking critically about the jobs that we have, if we are not monitoring job descriptions and actual skills required for jobs, then how do we expect the workforce to change? It's all Amen. on the responsibility, not all on the responsibility, but you certainly did drive this point home that it involves a lot of reflection, critical thinking and monitoring. So thank you for that. Uh, this has been amazing. We're gonna ask two more questions. And the first one is, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to bring to light? Something you wanna celebrate? Any, you, you put out a lot of papers. Uh, Y'all check out their LinkedIn it is phenomenal. Uh, the posts are data filled. They have some upcoming uh, events. Getting ahead of the curve is next week on uh, uh, July 26, and they're going to be talking about reskilling and why it's crucial for employers. And that we know is happening in community colleges across the country. So university folks, jump on that one, please. But Matt, anything you want to share, and then tell us what is the future of higher ed. So one of the reasons why um, skills and learning are so important um, is because um, they are critical to how people achieve um, e um, economic mobility and, and social mobility. We've been doing a lot of work recently at the Burning Glass Institute to measure um, to measure workers' experiences and to measure how well people are um, are uh, achieving mobility and and who's getting stuck. Um, we created um, last year together with partnership uh, with partners at the Harvard Business School and with the Schultz Family Foundation, um, a, something called the American Opportunity Index. Um, mm -hmm. 
And the American Opportunity Index was uh, is, is something that's really powerful. And I encourage people to check it out at AmericanOpportunityIndex.org. Um, and it's so powerful because it was built on some research that we did where we found that you could have two workers um, who are in the exact same role at directly competing companies who have entirely different prospects of moving up. That's maddening. Um, and totally, right? And so these are choices that people make without a lot of transparency. So we we created the index to measure the Fortune 250 based upon the mobility that uh, of their employees. Um, and uh, one of the things which wow. we learned is not only that it matters where you work matters, not only that employers play a huge role in the continued vitality of the American dream, but we're also increasingly using the metrics that underlie the index to be able to start doing things like measuring what are the best first step careers, how do different skills um, change the, the upward trajectory, um, the vector, as Stephen would say, um, associated with the career path. Um, and um, fascinating. Just uh, couldn't be more excited about that pillar of work, both the ability to measure outcomes, me outcomes for students, outcomes for workers, and to be able to use that to really have a better understanding of how, how people can be more successful in achieving mobility. This is like the Occupational Outlook Handbook on steroids. This is phenomenal. Y'all have to check out the American Opportunity Index. Uh, your students would love it. Uh, and if, if community colleges and universities could capitalize on bringing this to the forefront of their minds, we would certainly help students find the right place for them in the workforce. So thank you so much, Matt, for this work. It is fascinating. Thank you, Stephen, for being our guest co-host. Um, I hope we can all connect on LinkedIn. I already followed you, Matt. Um, and again, before we leave, tell me who does your social media posts because those are amazing. And, and the, the writing is really, it challenges other organizations to get dynamic about bringing personality to their posts. Well, um, all, all credit goes uh, to a range of my colleagues, uh, to Jenny Carvalho, uh, to Eric Leiden, to uh, to all the people on our team, Stuart uh, Andreessen, uh, to Debbie Wasden, uh, and and to a range of others. Uh, by the way, anyone who isn't already following God Levinon, our chief economist, really ought to do so. He's incredibly insightful. Yes. Um, so um, uh, you know, I'm I'm just it's such a blessing to get to work with such a phenomenal crew of people at the institute. Well, they bring the work to life, and um, we don't even need to address the equity angle of your work because the posts and everything is embedded um, so deeply. So thank you to all those people. I'm really enjoying it. And I'm so glad to follow you. I'm very impressed with your work. Uh, finally, as we close, we'd like to thank all of our guests and brief reminder to pick up the book Commencement. It is the book by Kate Colbert, Joe Salustio, and Elvin Freitas. Uh, Elvin and Joe are the founders of Ed Up. I am your guest host for the day, Dr. Michelle Cantu wilson It has been um, a wonderful experience to interview Matt Siegelman of Burning Glass Institute and to serve with Stephen in this interview. Um, thank you so much for your time. Make sure to follow, like, and share. I think we have exceeded 300,000 downloads. This, this podcast is on steroids. It is amazing. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've just ed upped. Attention. Forbes called commencement the beginning of a new era in higher education a dispensable touchpoint for what's being said in, about, and around higher education now. Don't miss the insights from 125 college and university presidents about what the future of higher education holds. Pick up your copy of Commencement on Amazon today.